What's happening, guys? Keith here with another Impact Wrestling Review. So today we're going to take a look at the January 25th episode of Impact, and I am once again joined by Ro. What's going on, man? Not much. How you doing today? Uh, not bad, not bad. Um, I hear you did not get to watch the show on Twitch, so you're going off of the YouTube page. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it might be... Um, my method to watch now just for the simple fact a I don't know what time they air on the west coast and b the time that I think they do I'm not home and I'm not about to wait two weeks to watch so I'll just catch YouTube <laughs> that's sad man but you know no excuses so <laughs> moving on so first before we get into things I want to reveal the winner of the autograph giveaway and that is Dan P I will leave a contact in the comment section below you can shoot me an email with your name and address and i will send those autographs out to you so what you saw of last night's episode ro what'd you think overall dude i tried to go in with you know being optimistic because i i never really liked even stemming back from when they went to mexico last time i was kind of like sour on it um it was okay um you know there's some things that kind of stood out to me but a lot of what I kind of worried about, just a tad bit, I felt was here. And then there's just some things that didn't make sense, but I'm sure we'll get into them. Yeah, and I'm sure it didn't help when I was uh, sending you messages about my thoughts as far as the Twitch uh, stream went. It just seemed very odd to me. I don't know if it was just me, but uh, it, it just kind of felt like the matches happened, and then we cut to Don and Scott Ball, whoever he is, and they were talking back and forth, and it would just go back to matches again. We'd just get, I, I don't know, it just kind of felt like it. the pacing wasn't there. Like, I found a stream online this morning, and I watched it a little bit that way, and it just felt like it paced so much better that way. But, uh, you know, I mean, this is the way things are now, so I guess I just got to get with the times and uh, kind of accept it. Now, do you feel that was just for this show, or do you, have you felt like this in previous shows since they've been on Twitch? I don't know. Last week, I enjoyed it more with Josh. I, I don't know. It was just the way, the way it was presented. Like it's just like the questions back and forth, and it was like getting Don's thoughts on the match, and you know he's the Booker, and he works behind the scenes. So it's just I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm getting too far out of being a fan and just kind of watching it you know my mind just keeps moving i'm like this doesn't really make sense but uh, i will give props they did remove the gwn flashback from the twitch stream so uh that that was good to hear or see i should say you think that's just for this week or you think that's something that they're gonna do moving forward <laughs> i mean you know i hope that's what they're gonna do but then again i don't think they really plugged the gwn at all on Twitch, I did hear that on the Pursuit channel, they did plug the GWN. They had some different commercials as well. You know, my thing has always been with the GWN. A, there's no problem in them trying to um, pimp it out, essentially, but you don't need to show full matches. And B, since they've had the GWN, there's only been a handful of times where they've actually showcase matches that involve talent that are currently on the roster and mm -hmm. i just thought if your selling point is to advertise matches of guys who've moved on whether they're in the e ring of honor or you know at various promotions like who who are you selling that to i mean the current fans like you know we appreciate their contributions while they were a part of well then tna we should say but that's no incentive to get it. And then if you're trying to appeal to casuals, once again, if they can watch them or they can watch them <laughs> currently wrestle in their um, whatever promotion they're associated with, they re they can just go that route. So I just thought the advertising of it or the marketing of it, I should say, has just always been poor. They should do a better job of marketing you know, some of the people on the current roster. I I've always thought a selling point during the time – you know, when I had figured that Eli was the franchise, you know, why not one flashback? Show how he won the world title. Mm -hmm. You know, that might get somebody like, oh, dang, you know, he was world champion. Like, let me catch that instead of showing us matches from 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> right. I mean, some things I understood, like when we had Ultimate X at homecoming and they would hype it up a couple weeks 
leading into it with old Ultimate X match, so people that are new to the product could get familiar with things. I mean, if it's relevant, then I'm fine with it. But yeah, like you said, it's just the way they were portraying it just seemed like it was it didn't make much sense. Just random. Yeah, and you know what? And that I think that's a good tool when you're talking about like Ultimate X, only because we hadn't gotten one in sh- some time so i thought that was a great way and i mean i wouldn't mind them doing that like just say if they were to ever do another king of the mountain match or some match that we haven't seen in some time and then you go and get like a flashback and yeah. you get one of that match i think it works good in that fashion but when you're getting like in bq used to always say this like they used to always show aj and samoa mm-hmm. joe oh, like, i remember his twitter rants yeah like who who are you trying to trying to uh sell this to you know market this to because the current fans like hey we you know they were nice under when they were in tna but we've moved on just like they've moved on right you know so i just didn't get how they were they were making them a selling point which is funny because it seemed like that was part of the whole regime's plan was to move away from tna and things like that like things they did like we don't see the Um, Like you said, the King of the Mountain match and things like that. And then again, they fall into the trap with the GWN flashback. Yeah. So, hey, I mean, that's good that they got it this week. But, I mean, (laughs) it might just be a a temporary thing. It could easily be back next week. So we got to stay tuned. (laughs) I mean, I I think they're just playing with things right now to see what works. And, you know, I, I saw a lot of people were thought that this week's program was well received but then again you know these are the same people that'll like everything that impact throws their way so it's tough to gauge a reaction off of people that are going to constantly tune in and like everything that they're getting yeah th- i think that's what's the hardest part nowadays just with anything like differing of opinions like i think we're in a society where everyone feels compelled to agree to everything i've always said you know, and I'm an Impact fan, just like you are. There's nothing wrong with fair criticism. I think if we can go out of our way and be like, man, this was an excellent show. Like, we know everything's not going to be great. It's okay to point out some of some of the uh, the flaws and whatnot. And that doesn't mean that, that you don't like the product any more than the next, you know, super fan. It's just, you know, being able to acknowledge like, hey, look, it's not always going to be good. Not everything's always going to be good. But when you say that, it's kind of, oh, well, you know, you're being selfish. And why can't you just enjoy? And, okay. You know, like yeah, no. as, as, as much as we praise it, I mean, you kind of just look at what's transpired with this company and you, you'd have to believe if it was as great. And I hate to say this, but if it was as great as some of us believe, I mean, they wouldn't be in the position they're in right now. Yep, and and that's completely true. And while I, you know, wasn't a huge fan of the way the show was presented, I did enjoy, I thought they put on good matches throughout the show. And, you know, like I said, there's, there's, you're going to have takeaways that are good and bad, but if the overall thoughts was it was good, then, then you know, you leave the show positive. So I guess we'll uh, start the show here, or do you want to talk a little about the uh, news that we had gotten midweek um, we if you want to touch on it, or uh, you want to touch on it right now, or you want to? Yeah, put- I guess. Did you get a chance to listen to the Wrestling Perspective podcast with Dennis Farrell and P. Williams that I sent you last night? No, nah, I'm actually gonna listen to it uh, when I head to the gym. Mm-hmm. No, no, I mean it was they did a really good job pointing. Like Dennis was just kind of getting PD's general reaction to things and asking if you know what the the reason is kind of behind this and uh you know he he wasn't completely surprised with sanjay just the f- simple fact that they were putting so much pressure on him he had so many roles to fill and he also made mention that abyss left creative uh earlier in the or mid last year during the slam anniversary time so it's interesting to to notice that because we've said that the creative kind of shifted after slam anniversary and that's when ratings dropped and things like that so i'm wondering you know if abyss leaving the creative team really had you know a lot to do with that and yeah it was just you could tell that pd was genuinely upset because you know he was with the company for a long time and him coming back recently uh sanjay was a big reason that he came back and you know they were like a close family so him going to work again and you know his friends not being there it's 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 just gonna be tough on him and uh you know he doesn't know what his role will be next 
Um, he thinks that Dreamer and uh, Conan will be good replacements, but it's tough to say, you know? I mean, there's Sanjay and Abyss were both big parts of the backstage in Impact Wrestling. And see, my thing is we'll never know how much of an influence they play played as far as the booking because and I and what I just thought was unfair was oh well that's why the creative has been so bad it's like hold on the people that tell you that everything is so good but somebody departs oh they're the reason why it's bad what I thought was unfair and not that I'm some Sanjay defender but even though they're working in creative Don and I think Scott are overseeing Mm -hmm. some of the decisions so if something there was some type of segment or some angle that was terrible, it was signed off on. It wasn't like Sanjay just said, "Hey, this is what I want to do," and that just happened. So it's kind of like if you're gonna blame Sanjay, kind of blame them for giving the okay on it. But once again, we don't. It's hard to attach who's responsible for what. And I think the the one thing, and I know getting Conan and Tommy Dreamer, I'm I'm you know, optimistic about it because I think those are two brilliant wrestling minds. Mm-hmm. But and you've mentioned this, um, I think the worry is you got so many people playing so many roles. Like I think when you have you know a whole bunch of agents that can devote to just that certain thing. It's it's better. I think when you have so much people wearing so many hats, you can wear them thin. And I mean, when I think of Conan, I mean, I guess maybe this is a way to remove him from LAX. But I mean, he I don't know. Is he in charge of creative in MLW? I, I don't know if he necessarily is there, but I'm pretty sure he's got a hand in there. I know he does bookings, I believe, for AAA as well. I'm sure he's got his own podcast. He, he's got so many things going on. And then Dreamer's running the House of Hardcore. So mm-hmm. mainly what I think Impact needs, and like I said, I hope hopefully this works, but what Impact needs, they need minds that can devote to nothing but Impact. Or like whether it's backstage or, you know, creative, et cetera, to devote to just that role. I think when you put so much on, on anybody, and that's just kind of in life, you're going to wear people thin. And it's, look, we, you know, a lot of us fans, we try to fantasy book, you know, it's all fun and games, but I can imagine it's probably hard as hell to book a wrestling show, let alone something that, you know, you're, you're taping for, you know, three, four episodes worth. So I can only imagine how hard it is. But I mean, when you got people having to focus on that and focus on other things and match layout and et cetera, et cetera, it, you know, it's a lot. But yeah. my, my, my biggest takeaway is like this. You know what? You can't minimize their contributions. I think Abyss and Sanjay, you know, in, in, let, let's face it, mainly part of the original TNA. Mm-hmm. I mean, they did a lot for the company. But and, you know, for the role that they're getting, I mean, it comes to show you that you know over there yeah i know <laughs> the mindset would probably be like oh they're just taking anybody from tna but they must have seen something in those two to want to bring them on board and yeah. have them a part of their creative but i just yeah. think it's unfair if you're going to criticize you know sanjay's decisions or even if abyss or you know praise abysses remember their stuff is signed off on so i mean you got to kind of look at the head of yep. creative Yeah, that's for sure. And I mean, like PD had said that you don't know what you're walking into when you're going to the tapings. You don't know what roles you're filling or you have to do. And he said, you know, I don't blame Sanjay if he left to go and he's going to WWE and he's just doing one single job. So he knows exactly what he's walking into. And, you know, the stress is less and things like that. And PD said, you know, we want to do what we can for the company. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's tough to do fill all these roles. Yeah. But so, yeah, we, we will see how that continues. Um, so I guess Vegas will be the fresh start with the quote unquote new creative team. Um, but even Scott and Don have have other roles. I mean, Don was doing stuff with New Japan. We saw him do Wrestle Kingdom and then have to fly in mere hours later to get to homecoming and. Scott has his own promotion up in Canada. So all these guys are doing multiple things. So it's it's tough for the full concentration to be solely on impact. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. And I think if they have people who are wearing so many hats and have, you know, their focus on so many other things, which, I mean, I guess makes sense. But it's going to kind of reflect the product at times. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, all right, so we will get into the show now. We open the show with Rich Swan versus Hijo del Vikingo. 
Um, this was a good match. Um, this is uh, not the first time we've seen Vikingo. Um, Don had made mention talking about wanting to sign him. He's uh, only 22 years old, very talented. Uh, but we have we didn't see any signings from Mexico last time they were there, right, Ro? Yeah, I don't believe so. I mean, I think they would work uh, some of, some of the shows, but that was about it. Oh, you know what? I apologize. I'm thinking about the uh, uh, um, I can never oh, Tahano and all of them. Mm. But that that was but that was before, way before. Yeah, that was during the GFW days when we actually had the uh, AAA roster wrestling, you know, pretty much normally on Impact. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, no, this was a good match. Uh, Swan went over with the 450 from the second rope. OVE comes out. Sammy says that Swan is like his little brother outside of here. They're tight. He says it's time Swan steps up and joins OVE. Sammy says that he's saved Swan. He says OVE is his real family. And he hands him the shirt again. Swan says the shirt is the right size, but this isn't a right fit, pointing to OVE. He leaves, and then Sammy continues to plead his case. I mean, I like what they're doing here. I think there's actually some real live events, real life events, I should say, that have taken place with Sammy and Swan. Um, I was reading things. I don't know what's true and what's not, but apparently uh, Sammy did actually help him out and stuff like that. You know what I just find it weird is just when you think about out of, out of homecoming, they kind of just jumped right into this. I kind of wish we would have gotten more of a backstory because it just came across as random as, "Hey, we I just want you to join OVE," and then it just kind of went from zero to a hundred where Sammy was getting personal, and <laughs> it just I don't know, just I guess just for me, like when I was looking at it, I felt like there hasn't been more kind of uh, built to the store. I kind of want to understand the relationship between them two because before all we seen from the start was, you know, Sammy facing Willie Mack and then Rich Swan interfering and then, you know, just telling Willie Mack to back off. And then that was that. And then we kind of get Sammy coming in and, you know, talking about how, you know, getting diving into his personal life and stuff. So it just kind of just seems thrown together in my eyes. But I mean, you know, I'm I'm interested to see. It's going to be quite funny because it looks like we're going to probably get. I'm imagining Sammy versus Rich Swan for the X Division title. So, uh, um, you know, you had some people who thought it was weird, uh, Sammy competing in the X Division when he had challenged Brian Cage previously. So, um, <laughs> it looks like we're headed towards that way again. Yeah, I mean, I, I I didn't mind that they planted the seeds before Homecoming and then they went right into it, but I I mean. The story is not about the X Division Championship. So, you know, that's another small gripe of mine. That was just like, had they done the Tessa and Gale angle and Tessa still held on to the Knockouts Championship. It was like LAX and the OGs where the tag titles were there, but they weren't the sole reason for the feud. And like you had said, Swan was the safe bet. Had they put the title on someone else, you could have had something different going on, an extra storyline, because this was going to be a storyline to begin with. Well, and you know what I thought, uh, I guess the way that I was looking at it as I figured that was the few they were heading towards. But I thought Rich Swan chasing OVE to try to capture the X-Division title would have been, you know, as compelling. But I mean, I like the fact that there's some type of story to this, but I feel like they kind of uh, didn't give us enough time to really build towards it. It's kind of one week, hey, join OVE next week. Oh, you know, I know everything about you and I helped you and all this and that, you know, getting all personal and stuff. So but I mean, it's something, though, so, and I can appreciate any time they devote some kind of type of angle with with Exavision wrestlers. So um, I think it'll work out in the long run, but it just kind of just seemed kind of <laughs> it went from zero to 100 for me. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But yeah, it should be good. I'm interested. You know, like I said, they've worked together before. There's history, so it will Hopefully make the feud good, and I'm sure their match will be good when we get it, which possibly could be April. I mean, that's that's a long ways away at their next pay-per-view. Um, they were advertising Vegas, and I believe they, that one of the advertisements were new champions. So I don't know if, if that means anything or they just kind of put it because they put like new new champions, new performers, things like that. But they might have actually said that last time they were in Vegas as well. I mean, it could be a way that they plan on doing a title change. And you know what? I hope 
And, you know, I understand in some instances, like, say, if you're running tapings in March or, you know, at the end of February and, you know, you got a pay-per-view coming up in, like, early April. I understand one thing, but they really got to use some of the, utilize some of these tapings to do some title changes. I'm not saying every set you got to change your title, but, I mean, I think you tell me if you agree or not. Long title reigns in this current iteration of the company, they don't really work as well. I think when somebody's champion, you know, they get a good, what, maybe three months, and then <laughs> it just seems like, okay, well, at least for me, like, I'm over it. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, the the shows are taped, so it's a little different. But if they, you know, if a title change does happen, you may get more people to tune in as well. Oh, definitely. And, you know, it comes it comes to show you and we'll get into it like, you know, people get hyped for title matches, you know, especially if there's somebody that it looks like, hey, they might have a chance to, to actually. win. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Uh, so up next, we have the debut of Melissa Santos. She is backstage. She is replacing Mackenzie. As far as we know, um, she interviews Cross and Moose. Cross says it's finally the night that Johnny's legacy dies and his begins. And then Moose says Cage won't be a factor because he is having some issues at customs and won't be here tonight. Um, which, <laughs> that's not the way it turned out, but I, I think we all expected that to be the case. Yeah, I, uh, I unfortunately didn't catch this, but I mean, you know, anytime they got Cross, Cross on the mic, I mean, I just love how, you know, his how, how eloquent he comes across. Well, everything he kind of says is believable he really you know speaks like he believes what he's saying and that translates to the audience as well you know he um he did a, a interview um with uh michael mike larkin you guys mm-hmm. should uh, check it out i recommend it but you could tell how much work he puts into his character and how much he cares like he cares and i think that's kind of one of the things in wrestling that it's kind of a lost start because he was even talking about too. I forgot the the co-host had asked, you know, him using the the Doomsday Saito because he, you know, that's essentially like a backdrop. Mm. And he was just going about how he wanted to do something that they are they. I, f- I forgot what it was. I mean, you got to check it out. But mainly, it was saying like I guess whoever was training him, you know, they were saying, trust me, when you hit this, it's gonna look so badass. You know, it might seem like just a regular move, but you know, in other words, he was just, just, you know, it was just how he came about getting his finisher. But right. you could tell that the, the dude really cares about his character and puts in a lot of work. And hopefully it pays off um, in impact, I should say. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think they really have a big star with him. I mean, the, the audience seems to uh, respond very well to him. And he's just kind of done everything on his own to be built up, you know. I mean, the way they introduced him as the attacker, that was that was really good. And then, unfortunately, he played backseat to Ares for a little while, and then Ares left, and he's kind of come into his own. And, again, it's one thing that Impact really needs to play the hot hand, and they have something here, so you might as well run with it. And, and it's homegrown. Like, I thought when they had that whole attacker thing, I said, it's one of two ways. I mean... You can either do somebody returning, you know, who's been a part of the company. I mean, that'd probably be the safe bet. Or I said, don't, you know, do it to get some former E guy. I said, or do it to de- debut a new a new guy. And mm-hmm. that's that's the route that they chose, and it's paying dividends. But now, like you said, right in the hot hand, it's time to capitalize capitalize on it, and you know, hopefully they do. Right. Uh, you just don't want them. And we'll get into it when we talk to, uh, about the main event. But, you know, you put the title on cage and all of a sudden Cross could fade to the back seat, and it happens again. And he fizzles out and you just you don't want that to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then we have another interview backstage. Melissa's interviewing Jordan and Kiara. Rosemary is brought up. Text comes up on the screen saying the darkness will take you to this is not your fight. So basically saying, Kiara and Jordan, stay clear. I got this. Uh, it was weird the way they did this because we led into commercial before the Cross and Moose interview. And then I think, or I don't remember, it was weird. But like we did an interview, went to commercial, came back, did an interview, and went to commercial again. It was weird the way they set up. Again, it was part of the pacing that I had a problem with. But it is what it is. Um, then we had some knockouts action. Kiara took on Taya. 
Um, I don't know. I'm sure you saw a highlight of this on YouTube, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, that drop kick that Kira hit on Taya in the corner was absolutely brutal. Yeah, man. I was, ugh. But you know what? I thought this was good because, you know, la- obviously last time we seen Taya, she was being tossed in the crowd. <laughs> but yeah. I-, I thought this was good for her. And, you know, the post-match promo, this is going to be g- great for her as far as with her title reign. I know this one was just a non-title match, but really make her look strong. You know, if, you know, with these Mexico tapings, you know, have her face maybe some of the local talent before she can enter her first feud, you know, Mm -hmm. and hopefully they have somebody waiting in the works. I mean, I don't know if they're going to do the rematch with Tessa. I'd like to imagine, you know, then that way that might be a way they can kind of move Tessa to the Gail Kim angle should should they uh, decide to continue it. But... Yeah, I really like this for uh, Taya. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, again, we know that in the last time they were in Mexico, they really played to the crowd. And now you have your champions that are very popular in Mexico. So, you you know, the crowd seemed very responsive. They seemed much better than last time. Um, but, yeah, no, it was good Good to see. Uh, I enjoy Taya's work, and she put on a good match here. She ends up getting the victory after hitting a powerbomb out of the corner, and then she makes Kira tap out. Uh, Josh interviews Taya afterward, asking how it feels to be back. She says, you know, the fans here in Mexico have made her who she is today. She calls out Cross for ruining her and Johnny's moment at homecoming. And then she says when Tessa comes back from suspension, she will be waiting. So I would assume they'll do something between the two to completely put Tessa into a storyline with Gail and have this over with between the two of them for now. If I'm a betting man... Uh, they're going to do it in Mexico because just how over Ty is. Cause the one thing, my one takeaway, and I mean, we'll have to see when they uh, come back to the States, but our people were, was that at what happened at homecoming where they were booing her? Was that just for that night or have fans kind of turned on her? Um, I think it was probably more the situation, but it, it's tough to say. It could be the lead to the fans turning on her as they've turned on Johnny. Yeah. And, you know, the power couple now has the titles together. So that I'm sure that could sour some people as well. Yeah. I, and I, I think, and that was my thing that night. I think that, you know, my, I was of the opinion of that's probably what people soured on just mainly to the, how they both won the titles, you know? So, but yeah. And I, and I thought this was cool. I mean, you know, I can't knock Impact for capitalizing on that, realizing that, you know, she's mega over in, you know, putting her in a position where, you know, fans will cheer her and make, and she looked strong. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think Don had mentioned as well trying to sign Kira. Kira, I don't know exactly how to pronounce her name because the way, you know, the announcers pronounce it and the way they pronounce it in Mexico are two different ways. But uh, I think she's very young as well. So Don had mentioned signing her. So maybe uh, we will see her one day. Uh, then we go backstage and Melissa Santos catches up with Rich Swan. She asks if what Sammy had said out there is true. Rich says, yes, it's true, but there's more to it. So again, just continuing it more. Um, then we got your favorite segment of the night with the Rascals, which I actually enjoyed this one. I thought it was pretty funny the way they did it. Um uh, they were figuring out where they were. Uh, I think Trey said, I think we're in Canada because none of them could read the sign outside the building. And then Zachary Wentz uh, said, no, we're in Mexico. And then they did the whole voiceover in Spanish. And I don't know. Like I said, I got a kick out of it. Um, I-, I know you're not the biggest fan of these. And, you know, I like I said, either people respond well to it or they don't. Yeah, I unfortunately didn't catch it, so oh, okay. yeah, I don't know. That might either could have been a blessing, or maybe I missed out on something. <laughs> no, they, it was just a little fun segment. That that was about it. Um, and so this this was interesting, and I'm, I know this was posted on YouTube. The uh, Scarlet training video where she will debut in three weeks. Um, she was training with Bobo. She was feeling malnourished, so she ate a banana, and um, apparently on the pursuit. Uh, channel they censored the banana <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, all right so uh this so after this had taken place we went to uh don uh, don and uh 
I already forgot the other guy's name. Um, but he said he's, I don't know if he said he has a daughter or if he had a daughter, he hopes his daughter doesn't handle bananas like Scarlett does when she gets older. It, it was just weird and awkward. You know, it's, it's really weird though, how, and that's, it just leads me to believe like the whole pursuit thing that is just going to kind of justify having him on TV, but it looks like they're going to do everything, uh, on Twitch. You know, if, if if I'm making sense, yeah. Because no, no. I've heard, I've heard, uh, and it might have been you who mentioned it was talking about how they censor certain things on uh, pursuit. Yeah, I think hell and ass, something like that, stuff you would normally see on uh, uh, regular cable TV. Yeah, and I mean, with and I'm, I get why they probably censored it in the sense of uh, you know, the way she was eating a banana kind of gives the impression <laughs> of you know, I don't need to give <laughs> details, you know, but. Yeah, that, that I, I find that interesting. But, hey, that's cool. I'm really interested to see how her character is going to be, uh, you know, r- as far as her competing in the knockouts division. So uh, I want to see how, you know, her, the character that she has now, how that translates when she actually wrestles. Yeah, it'll be interesting. So we get to see her debut in three weeks. That's, I guess, the first tapings from Vegas. Yeah, and I, I thought they <laughs> they put that out there, you know, accurately because at first I was just like, "What well, three weeks? Why we? <clears throat> excuse me, why we got to wait so long?" But <laughs> the timing, the timing's right, so that's that's good. Yeah, yeah, and I think that makes the most sense. But yeah, no, I'm I'm interested. I mean, like like I said, from all the uh, matches I've seen her wrestling, she's good in the ring, and uh, she'll bring definitely a different aspect to the knockouts division. And again, it'll be interesting to see how she's perceived by the fans. Um, then up next, we had the Desi Hit Squad versus the Rascals. Um, you know, this match was much better than I had anticipated. The crowd really seemed behind the Rascals. We actually got a few Rascals chants going on. Um, but these guys definitely know how, how to generate a good crowd response. Um, and the Desi Hit Squad is a huge heat magnet. Apparently, um, uh, Gama Singh was introducing... Uh, both members of the hit squad. And before that it wasn't shown on TV, but I guess apparently he ran down some Mexico Mexican legends and which is why they, he was getting booed. I don't know why they didn't add, leave that into the stream, but uh, I figured that would have been a little good spot to put in. Cause he's done that before, right? Where he ran down like uh, people in Canada, I think. Yeah, I think, I, <laughs> yeah. I, was it Bret Hart? Was, yeah. Yeah. I believe okay. so. You know, I, yeah. Um, and I told you this. I said when when I saw this match advertised, I figured I said, yeah, Russell's winning. <laughs> you know, I um, and I mean that's good. They're the young upcoming team. Uh, you know, I'm assuming that they have plans for down the road. Um, I just wonder about the Desi Hit Squad's future, not only as a as a team, but just individuals, because it just seems like now, you know, we've always talked about needing enhancement talent. That looks like what they've become. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do miss the uh, Gama Singh beating both members of the Hit Squad. Their little videos. I always found those entertaining. But and, and I, I guess know, they've gotten away from it. And you know, too, what I had thought uh, initially was, you know, when we saw them kick Gersinder out, that they were going to repackage Gersinder and then he was going to feud with him, kind of like in a low-level feud, which, I mean, right. that's fine. Gets everybody on the card. But... I mean, I don't even know if Gersinder's even still part of Impact. I don't know, man. I mean, like, I think I've seen him post on Instagram because I think I follow him there. But, I, yeah, no, it's it's weird the way they did it. And, again, they advertised so many people in the Desi Hit Squad, which Raj thing wasn't even originally advertised for the group, but he came in. So still think it was something that they had planned that just didn't didn't pan out the way they wanted it to. Well, and then they, and that's a, and that was a Don idea too. Not to, not to pile on Don, but that was a Don idea. What the hit squad you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, because I think they really could have gone into uh, more detail with the Gama Singh character, because it seems like you know he is a legend in wrestling. He does have hit family history. He's still got he's what Jinder's uncle, I think. I just feel like they could have done more with storytelling and things like that, but. We'll see if they end up doing something with it. Rascals end up going over with the hot fire flame, the pushing moonsault. So that was cool to see as usual. 
Uh, then we have Melissa interviewing Johnny. Johnny says seeing his wife back here tonight puts some thoughts in his head. He can't wait to get his hands on Killer Cross. Uh, he calls him human garbage, and then he says he is going to take him to the Slam Town dump. Oh, Johnny. <laughs> you know, I think him in, uh, him being the kind of cornball face, I think it works. And I think they should just kind of just play to it. Don't have him do more than, you know, what he's uh, capable of. Just have him be a cornball. No, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's fine. But, it, again, it's just where is their target audience at? You know, if it was kids, he would be the perfect baby face. But I don't know. This is something like I I had mentioned to you. It seemed like this regime, their whole plan was to bring back the quote unquote smart fans. So that's the way they started to book toward. And when those fans weren't coming in, they were tuning off the casual fans because we've seen a lot of these matches become more and more spot heavy uh, where it seems like they're becoming more niche in the style of matches and it just seems like they're they're not sure who they're targeting now and i think that uh that hurts is a little as well well and you know too i think when you're talking about targeting kids i mean we've seen more and i i haven't really had paid attention to that much but when you think about the impact zone that's where you really had kind of more of the kids involved i think too maybe in new york or so on some of the explosion episodes but they have talent like i'll say johnny and um i can't think of anyone else at the top of my head who probably appeal more to the kids KM and ba could yeah well you know you even got the old, um older fans that like them too but i'm mm-hmm. saying there's some that just tailors uh you know mainly for kids and that's what you want to capitalize on. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't think they know what their base is. I mean, they, I think they probably think it's more on lines of 18 to 35. I'm not sure about that. You know, like it, it, but like you said, sometimes when you're talking about segment segments like this, and then the show comes on at 10 o'clock and stuff, I, you know, doubt kids are watching like mm-hmm. no grown man's talking about, yeah, take you to slam town dump, like you know. <laughs> but like I, I'm able to, you know, I've accepted that that's how they're pushing him, and that's why I, uh, I didn't think him turning heel would do any favors. I just think just leave him as a cornball. He's a cornball face, and I think you know when you have you put put him up against certain individuals, and if you have that monster heel who, you know, whether it's a cross or whomever and stuff, like it, it makes makes it compelling. Yeah, but that's why the booking at Homecoming was just so weird. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it's just strange. Uh, then we had LAX backstage. Uh, Conan brings up what was said last week for more teas to the Lucha Brothers. He says that, you know, maybe he's overreacting and everything is fine. He apparently makes a six-man tag for next week with two guys that he's got his eye on. So it'll be the Lucha Brothers and Taurus versus LAX and Daga. So uh, that match should be good. Uh, I've heard good things about the six man that took place. Um, I do know Daga is currently dating Tessa Blanchard. So I I have seen some of his work and he's pretty good in the ring. But uh, we will see that next week. Uh, Then we had Ethan Page versus Trey. He, I guess, lost his last name and he is now just referred to Trey. Um, I don't know. This was uh, interesting here. I wasn't sure how they were going to book the match with... uh, I mean, the the beginning of the match, Ethan was pretty much overpowering Trey. Trey did get some moves in on the outside, but then had a tough time mounting offense in the ring. Uh, Ethan had uh, control of the match. He had Trey in a a fireman's carry position on the top rope. Trey is able to escape. They battle back and forth for a bit, and Trey picks up the victory with the fresh to death, which is uh, basically Cody Rhodes' crossroads. What do you think of this match here? You know, I still, before I get into it, I still can't wrap my head around, like, you know, why they didn't push Desmond Xavier as the single star out of the wrestles. Nothing against Trey. Like, from what I've seen, I, I like his work, and, you know, he has a bright future. But, I mean, that's just my thing. You know, I thought it was a little bit strange, but then, too, we're kind of seeing with Ethan Page, it looks like he's falling into you know, wrestling regular matches and exhibition matches. Like he's mm-hmm. going kind of going back and forth. Um, this is one of those matches I think, you know, both could have benefited from the win, but obviously since they're pitting 
competing against one another. Somebody has to take the loss. Yeah. But I thought this was good for Trey. Um, just hopefully they keep, you know, he keeps racking up wins and, you know, maybe we can see, uh, I don't want to say a feud, but kind of a rivalry maybe down the road built up between him and Rich Swan. I think they could put on some stuff. And then as for Ethan Page, um, you know, I, I, in, I know we beat this like like a drum, but <laughs> I just really feel like he's a guy who would be tailor made if they had some type of secondary title. Mm-hmm. And I think you're seeing with somebody like him, who you know, I don't want to say he's lost in the shuffle because he's appearing, but there's just really no direction. You know, he wrestles somebody one week, then he's doing exhibition stuff. Like I, he really just need, and especially with Matt Seidel going down, you know, he just yeah. kind of just needs a direction. Well, I know. Don or Josh, one of them made mention to it that that's how versatile he is, where he can wrestle someone like Eddie Edwards one week and then wrestle an X division match the next week. But I mean, how far is that actually going to carry him? You know? Yeah, because I mean, I think he has some promise. I know he had tweeted out that he wants to be. I don't know if he did this a while back. I don't know if he said he wanted to be the face or wanted to be a champion. And I mean, I think he has the tools to get there, but mm-hmm. it's just he just needs some sort of direction. The one thing that I would love Impact to do, and I think what they should, you know, start doing, they need to start doing some type of um, some type of tournament or something. You know, where say the winner wins, like I don't know, and then that gives him a number one contendership. Because I think with the tournament, sometimes you know, when you got a guy or even gal who's you know running through, like that really helps build them, and then that's mm-hmm. something that they could actually build off on. Well, you gain momentum that way too. Yeah. And again, we haven't seen number one contenders matches in a while. It just seems like, you know, a thing happens and then all of a sudden you're in a feud with the champion. Yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. just there's really no I think the thing that the company's missing too, there's really no type of bridge to kind of elevate talent. Like I think it's just kind of just one week, hey, you're getting a title shot, boom. Like, there's nothing where it's like, hey, this guy or this gal's been, you know, she went through this person or he went through this person. Now he's in line for, you know, he or she's in line for a title shot. Mm -hmm. Like, there's nothing that really kind of bridges that elevation. It's just more of kind of just, I'll just throw it together. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sometimes how it translates to TV. And I know we felt that way before. Mm -hmm. Um, So we had Eli Drake and Eddie Edwards backstage. Apparently three weeks from now, we're going to have Triple A versus Impact. Um, I think the Impact team was like Eddie Edwards, Eli Drake, Falaba, and somebody else. Um, I don't remember who was on the Triple A team. I think it was Psycho Clown, um, Aerostar, and a few other guys. But uh, they mentioned something about a World Cup. I don't know if it was just Eli saying stuff. But uh, Eli says he wants to get the old Eddie Edwards back, similar to what he said last week. They actually played the whole um, promo that Eli had cut after the match last week. And then he said next week it's going to be Eli Drake and Eddie Edwards versus the Rascals. And he wants Eddie to bring the old Eddie. So that's uh, interesting to have them team up. But I guess that's the route they're going with Eli trying to get Eddie away from the hardcore crazy persona. Um, so I'm interested to see where they go there. I like both of those men, and I know they're capable of putting on a good show. Yeah, I, you know, I will say, even though, um, and I, I'm sure you feel this way just like others, you know, we really kind of want to see Eli back in the main event. But I will say this, the pairing of these two, see, you know, kind of interests me. Yeah, I like what they did last week. I mean, even just, the, I think, what did they, two weeks ago, they just met each other backstage, and I kind of, was hoping that they would go this route because, uh, like I said, I like both of their work and I think they're both good and can put on a uh, compelling story. Yeah. And that brings us to the main event. Johnny Impact versus Killer Cross for the uh, Impact World Championship. Uh, so what did you think of this match? Uh, it was going well. I think Johnny Impact and Killer Cross have great chemistry. I want to say this is the third match that they've had facing one another because mm-hmm. this is stemming back from final hour they have great chemistry and i really wish this was kind of the focal feud that we're getting in the world title picture instead of what we're kind of getting and i thought the match was going fine and then up until you know we get the cage interference um before i kind of elaborate some i want to hear your thoughts no i i agree it seems like i mean while i like the 
point of having a bunch of moving parts, it just seems like adding so many people is taking a little bit away from it. Yeah, you know, and don't get me wrong, I get it. Like, they kind of want to showcase, hey, this is the main event scene. But, man, I just really think if they really zeroed in on Johnny Impact and the Killer Cross feud, because now there's so much to it. You know, you mm-hmm. got you got Cross attacking his wife and attacking Johnny backstage and choking him out. And, you know, there's so much. Like, this should be the feud. I get it. They want to push Cage. And there's nothing against Cage. But Cage is a sure bet. Like, <laughs> there's nobody there's nobody that doesn't think he's not winning the title. So uh, it's the, like Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 you finish, you finish. Yeah, and I'm just saying it's just like and you it's like even though you want to believe like man, the Cross is going to be next in line, like you'd be fooling yourself to think that. We know it's pr- more than likely going to be Cage. I'd be shocked if it is Cross, but you it, you can tell they want it to be Cage, you know? Even when we seen a um uh, uh, cross when he hit the Doomsday Saito, and then Cage just hops back up. And mm-hmm. He's clearing the house like that's who they who they want, and it's just like it's not that I have so much a problem with it, but if you give him, give, if he's next in line and you give him the belt, who's he gonna feud with? The same people that he's feuding with now, like right. you you gotta have some type of long term plan. I think just for any time when they put the title on baby faces Mm -hmm. i think with hills it's so much they can do but i think with the baby faces when you don't have that kind of um somebody on the same level as you to that you can go up against and feed off of it that's why a lot of the face runs kind of uh get you know our doom and gloom real relatively quick because they never really have that person on their level that that they can face. And I think with Johnny impact and then with the um, emergence of killer cross, like we have that. So it, I just feel like it's a better route to go. I mean, but Hey, I'm no booker, but I think that was just, (laughs) that was just my thing. Like I'm watching this. I'm like, I want to see this. This is the title title food. I want to see like nothing against cage cage is going to get his, his shot. I mean, we're only a couple months removed from him being X division champ. Yeah. Like, Like capitalize on cross, pull the trigger on cross. I mean, once once he came in and took out Lashley, I knew that he was destined to be champion. There was no doubt about it. Honestly, I'm surprised it took this long for it to happen. But yeah, no, I think definitely the way to do it is to continuously screw Brian Cage and have Johnny end up dropping the title to Cross, like you had said, and then you you kind of build Brian up to be that other baby face. He can eventually take the title off of Cross, and then maybe you could go into a program with between uh, Brian Cage and maybe Eli because they have had history together. They used to tag together. Yeah, and 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 that would be the route. But then too, you know, there there's some that think that maybe um, Eli's gonna turn face. So it's so many different routes that they can go. I think the one thing that Impact has to stop doing is stop going with the safe bet. You mm-hmm. know, trust your creative enough that hey, we can you know take a detour and it'll it'll work itself out. The um, best things that have worked for them are things that they fell into, yeah. as opposed to what they've had kind of like scheduled. I mean, unless the creative wants to go with the safe bet. <laughs> yeah, you know? And, you know, and I what I, I kind of feel, too, where it's gotten to a point is, you know, some of the higher salaried uh, stars, they have to kind of warrant that salary. So they, that's probably why they put them in the position that they put them in. Yeah, no, no that makes sense. But, yeah, no, obviously, uh, Moose gets himself involved in this match. Cross takes advantage. He goes on the on the offense for a while. Johnny eventually starts to gain some momentum. He hits a springboard spear. Cross is able to get his foot on the rope. Johnny goes for Starship Pain. Cross evades, sets up the cross jacket, and that's when Cage comes in from the crowd. He clotheslines both Cross and Impact. Moose gets in the ring. All four men fight. Cross and Moose eventually leave, and Cage and Johnny get into each other's faces and have a stare off in the ring. So, I mean... I mean, they and then this builds to a tag match, I think, next week, which I had said, I think, a couple weeks back that I know they're just not going to be able to help themselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense because even too, you know, and I think we had talked about this when we had said maybe they'll do a fatal four way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't look like Moose is really involved. If anything, he's just accompanying um, Cross. I mean, I guess he could have a side feud with Cage that could keep him busy while Johnny Impact is facing Killer Cross, but 
you know, it seems like this is the route they're going to go. But so, yeah, we're getting a tag match. That's <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what they said. So we got tag team partners that didn't like each other before homecoming. Now mm-hmm. we're getting the post homes. Interesting. <laughs> yep, that's uh, pretty much all there is to say about that one. <laughs> but again, all the wrestling was good. It was just uh, I thought the the show was paced a little weird, but that could have just been the Twitch stream because, like I said, I watched another stream where there was no interruptions, and I I really enjoyed that one. So, I mean, it could also be the fact that it was you know eleven o'clock at night, and I was up at five o'clock that morning. You know, it's it's tough staying up late. For this, it's 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 just a tough spot to be in, especially when the show is only shown live and then you have to wait seven days or ten days, whatever it is, to go on the GWN. Just a tough position they're in. Yeah, and then it's just kind of like, and you know, I, I always look at the method that I watch, and I'm not saying everybody follows suit, but you know, you would imagine some people might be in the position that I'm in. And it's like this. If you know, just say for example, it starts the stream starts at, let's say, 8 o'clock my time. Mm-hmm. And I get home like at 8.30. I've already missed 30 minutes. So now I can either, uh, you know, jump onto the stream, catch, you know, what's going on, and then probably later on read up on it, or just wait till it's on YouTube. And even though I know a lot of times with the YouTube, they don't show every single thing, but they show enough where really you can watch it on YouTube, the highlights, and you've watched the show and that's a thing if their whole main goal is to get people to not only watch on twitch but to subscribe you got to make twitch to be the end all be all like hey this is how you're gonna watch it Mm -hmm. like putting it on youtube and putting you know majority of everything it's one thing you put you know a few minute few minute to few second clips but when you put majority of everything that happened on the show you could watch the show like that so i mean I don't know. I mean, I know there's a, you know, uh, you know, some, a bunch of people who are able to watch and they enjoy it. And I mean, that's cool. That's good that they're able to see. But I mean, we got to kind of think of as fans at times, not, you know, not just for us, but for everyone else, too, who do want to see it. Mm-hmm. Not and, the ones that want to just look for it to go trash it, but the ones that actually want to see it, but can't do the you know, work or whatever like that. Well, even that, I mean, you know, you have people like myself who do like to watch all different types of promotions. Now you have uh, New Japan on from 8 to 9 on Access, and then you have uh, WOW Superheroes or Superstars, whatever the show is called, with the the new women's uh, wrestling show. I don't get Access, so I can't watch it. But that's on from 9 to 10. So you have some people already watching two hours, and then you're going to have to sit through another two hours of wrestling because there's no replay of it you can't dvr it and it's it's just a tough spot to put them in yeah definitely that's it and i mean hopefully something will come about this and they'll eventually figure out a way that people can watch anywhere anytime even though that's how they advertise it but uh um, the, the numbers were better this week, though. I think they topped out at about 10,000, which was up uh, a little bit from last week. Uh, they had more subscribers this week again. And uh, I think their page views for the whole day were up this week over the last two weeks that it was on Twitch. So at least they're moving in a positive direction in that note. I think the goal would be to, I think just at this time, since it's still kind of fresh, they need to maintain a solid number. That way, like if they can just, and this is what I've always kind of thought with the ratings, you know, before they kind of took the nosedive last year, find a number that, you know, you're always going to be at and then build off of that. So like, just say if the number is 8,000, you know, the goal is to at minimum stay at 8,000, not anything higher, wonderful, but you never want it to dip, dip yeah. under that. And I think if they can get a consistent number, I think that'll be key. But I think that's been the hardest thing, especially when you're talking about, you know, at a certain time in live, like there's going to be some Fridays people have stuff to do. And, you know, that's one less viewer or, you know, maybe they go to a show or like even when you think about, oh, well, that that one uh, is airing today. But I'm just saying you think about. (laughs) <laughs> what if they accidentally have a one night only at the same time they have well, Twitch? They did that last night. They had a uh, they had a live show. It was Wrestle Pro versus Impact last night in Brooklyn, uh, which will be shown tonight on Twitch. But I mean, what, what are you? Gonna, you're alienating your audience. They they can't 
go watch your TV show and also go live to one of your shows? Like it's either one or the other. I think the I think though I don't remember what the card was, but I think they probably figured that, you know, unless you live in that city and still though you don't want to develop that mindset that, you know, yeah, those people would go live, but I think they figure people aren't ordering them like that. But I mean, I don't know. Yeah, well, I just mean live. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. But yeah, that show will air tonight on Twitch. Um so it looks like they had a good card there. And then they're actually doing a one night only taping tonight as well. So it's a pretty busy weekend for Impact. Um, anything else we want to touch on? Uh, real quick. And I guess to piggyback off of um, uh, last week when we were talking about Oh, okay. About Jared, I, know what you, yep, I know exactly where you're going here. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we find out about uh, Kenny Omega was almost close. And look, I'm just of the mindset. I'd rather this information not even get out because almost isn't going to be good enough. We know with impact and where they are now, it's all about results. So telling people, hey, we almost signed this person. We almost signed this person. You know, there's only so many almosts before people start losing faith. And my my thing was just like this. I say, I, I thought to myself like this. Now, money's not an issue that's what we've been told like mm-hmm. I, i'm a firm believer that these guys are friends of don so they're not gonna throw him under the bus what we'll, we'll friend would do that right. but think about it they these guys would rather sign with something that hasn't set you know hasn't uh um not not on TV yet. That's in the works. It's in the makings. Okay, the the foundation is being set. They rather go with that. And sign on board with that. I don't know in Kenny Omega's case, then sign with something that's already you know established, so to speak. Right. So I think sometimes you just kind of have to read between the lines. I do believe there was kind of a um, there was a, at least a conversation, and I think they probably politely declined. But you know they wanted to make sure to give Impact the good rub, like hey, it, this is a good place, mm-hmm. good place to sign. I think, and uh, I think I've mentioned this before, if they really wanted to put over Impact. I, I think they should probably would have should have said something in the lines of like, hey, you know what? The only the reason why I didn't sign because I just feel like, you know what? This is a young, you know, young person's company. Like this is where the young talent, they have the, all this young talent. And I don't want to be no old face uh, in the way Stealing of some, the spotlight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that would have really opened the eyes more where it's like, well, OK, you know, they're going for a youth movement because we're seeing now with, you know, a lot of other companies there's so much of a reliance on signing veteran talent. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you know, they're going to take the spotlight and then there's a lack of developing, you know, young stars. So I just kind of thought that would have been a better way instead of telling people like, Hey, we almost got them. And it's like, you know, to brag about, Hey, we almost signed Jericho. We almost signed this. Hey, we almost got on WGN almost isn't good enough. (laughs) Right. No, you're a hundred percent. Right. And, uh, it, it was also interesting, I think, yesterday, because uh, Shane Strickland is a free agent, he posted an image of him going, where am I going? And he had, like, New Japan, Impact, Ring of Honor, and WWE. And, I mean, I don't know. W- w- what's the point in it? You, you you probably have your mind made up, you know? Are we yeah. going to get another case where it's like, oh, we almost signed him, too, but we didn't? Yeah, and, I mean, it's just, <clears throat> like I said, I, I just believe they're at the point right now. They just got to utilize what they have. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really kind of have to build, whether it's the, t- the Twitch or, you know, to a lesser extent pursuit. They really got to utilize what they have because you bring somebody on board, you know, you're going to want to warrant signing them. So you're going to put them at the forefront. Somebody else, else is going to get lost in the shuffle. It's just so many different things. But yeah, I agree. And some of that's on wrestlers too. Like they kind of know with the impact fan base, what, you know, some of the fan base has gone through. Right. So well, it's like when KM, he, he's got 45 days on his contract left. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or like even remember with Conley, when Conley had, had tweeted, tweeted that. And I mean, I, I guess too, you can't be so sensitive, but it just makes you wonder is someone who's happy. Are they saying stuff like that? Given that they know, you know, some of the stuff that the company kind of gone through, are you tweeting things like that? I don't mm-hmm. think so. I don't think so. So it, I, I guess that's that's just my thing. But yeah. you know, I, I do expect a lot of changes. And I mean, like in KM's part, I wouldn't 
be surprised if he does depart. I think we're going to see more departures. I think a lot of talent that we haven't seen in some months, I think it's a situation where contracts are going to, ex- they're just letting the contracts expire and then right. that's it. Now, I don't know if we're going to be getting new talent in. I Like I said, I think they're probably going to just clear the decks and just kind of stick to mm-hmm. what they what they have given the budget that they're running on. But um, yeah, we just have well, to it's see. been interesting because like you said, we've seen such a focus on the rascals and things like that, where it seems like only certain people have been showcased. So there's definitely a possibility there, but the one interesting thing with the whole uh, Kenny Omega thing was that I guess this was if he had re-signed with new Japan. So he would have worked there and then he was going to work like 30 dates in the States with impact but the weird thing is, is that Impact and New Japan don't have any real working relationship. So I don't see how that would have happened. And I mean, somebody had posted images last night of a Ring of Honor show and the arena was very empty. You would think that with the elite going to AEW and them kind of distancing themselves from Ring of Honor, that Ring of Honor or one of them should step up and be like, all right, maybe it is time we partner with Impact when we didn't want to do it because we were able to draw a crowd, but now look at it. Well, I think they're all like, and that's another thing too. I think, you know, the whole ex- exclusivity, like, that's going to harm Impact in the long term. They're going to have to start locking down people as crazy as it sounds. I know, you know, they were at the forefront of hey you know we give our talent freedom to work here and work there but they're gonna have to start doing that because you know the partnerships and you're looking at ring of honor for example you know they're in competition so to speak i mean yeah i know people want to trash them and look they've trashed uh impact in the past so you know i'm not you know i do believe you reap what you sow but they're in rebuild mode Mm -hmm. and i think you know, a lesson that's learned is, see, when you're so reliant on certain talents and they depart and you kind of that's the focal point of your company. This is what you end up with. So I think that's why the goal, <clears throat> excuse me, and we've mentioned this with impact, always have somebody waiting in the wing, wings to take the mantle. So mm-hmm. if somebody does depart, because, look, there's so much movement in wrestling now where, you know, you don't have people staying for, you know, five or double digit years. It's kind of foreign nowadays so what you have to do is you know keep you know having you know a, a developing talent so you know you don't fall off the face of the earth and i think Re- ring of honor i mean they've done a great job signing some names but they're in they're in a rebuild mode and uh um so i don't know i, I can't really see a part partnership benefiting either like i said i had thought and I mean, I don't think it'll happen now because I think, you know, people have turned on AEW. I mean, I don't know how that happens. They're not even up yet. But <laughs> but I thought I said what would have been a cool thing is why AEW was, you know, while they're looking for their TV deal. If they just, you know, ran a little mini invasion, you know, you have some AEW talent appear, you know, some of the lead talent appear on impact programming. It doesn't have to be the focal point, but just, you know, work some type of angles and so just for a couple months. And then that way that aids AEW when they try to, you know, get off on T get on TV. And then it also helps the ratings and impacts, you know, absolutely case. But I mean I don't think I don't think that's gonna happen. So yeah. Yeah, probably not. But uh we are over an hour now, so I think this will probably be a good time to cut. <laughs> um so thanks again, man, for joining me. I really appreciate having you on here. Uh and uh yeah, any closing words? No, no problem. I enjoy uh being on, talking wrestling, talking impact. Um overall, like I said, it was an okay show for me. Um some bright spots, so looking forward to next week. And uh I guess we will be back here same time, same place. So thanks for listening to our podcast. And until next time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye. Did you like that video? If so, click here to check out more great content. Thank you for supporting the Clock Cleaners podcast.